cameras. Um, I'm, my name's Doug, Doug Gaffin. I'm a biology professor. I've studied scorpions for quite a long time. I'm also uh, currently the interim dean of the Honors College. And my biggest claim to fame is that I share a, a house with your professor, uh, <laughs> Dr. Mark we're married. So Dr. Hoff Nagels and I are our husband and wife for quite some time. So um, I want to share with you my passion about scorpions and just give you a couple of ideas about what's going on and why we're so interested in these animals. And then I've got some with me. I'll hopefully let you take a really close look at a scorpion. Maybe you want to take a picture, in fact, you don't want to, do you? <laughs> no. Well, I used to be really afraid of scorpions. When I started my graduate work, I had nightmares about scorpions. Now, after I've learned their behavior, I've sort of relaxed and I kind of understand them. So I want to share some of these things with you. Scorpions are found in lots of cool things, like, you know, they, they make their way out in Halloween and tattoos and rock bands and so forth. Uh, they also find them, there's their way to belt buckles and yo-yos and things like that. I am really interested in their sensory systems. I, I want to know how scorpions make their way around their desert environment. Here's just a little survey of some scorpions from around the world. This is probably the most dangerous one. This is called Androcinus. It's got a really nasty venom, and its tail is bigger than my finger, and it can stain forwards and backwards. Really uh, a very dangerous animal found in the Middle East. And here's a relative of it, the, the black fat-tailed scorpion. And you see a really cool thing about scorpion biology is that the babies crawl out of the mom. So that's a female. They go up on top of the mom, and they stay there for about a week until they molt. So I think it's kind of cute, the little scorpions on the top. <laughs> this, this is uh, Lyurus, also from the Middle East. This one's got the most dangerous venom, but its claws are not so strong. But you see little feeble claws and very strong venom in the tail. And this one here, you can sometimes find at pet shops. Uh, this is the emperor scorpion from Western Africa. It's got very big claws, but its venom isn't as strong. You can let this one walk on you. If I don't have any with me today, but I would let you do that just as long as you don't upset it too much. <laughs> um, so there's sort of a rule of thumb here as far as venom. That, sorry, before I say that, there's a great size difference in scorpions from the largest one currently on the planet is from India. It's this one here. It's the uh, heterometrous species, and you see it's a really very large animal. And the smallest one was recently found from the Dominican Republic, and this is Microtichus, which is a little cute little guy. This is an, actually an adult, uh, but it's uh, so small it can easily fit on the tip of your finger. Now, again, with the venom, it's a rough rule of thumb, is that the smaller the claws, the more dangerous the venom, right? And a lot of people say that, hey, Dr. Gaffin, I got, I got bit by a scorpion. And I say, no, you actually got stung by a scorpion. Uh, scorpions all have this, this venom in their tail, and it's, it's really a bouquet of peptide. It interacts with your sodium and potassium channels of your neurons. You know, this is how your neurons work. They open and let ions in, right? And, uh, and that conducts an impulse. So the scorpion venom artificially triggers those. So if I get stung on the finger, I may feel hot and cold and hit with a hammer all at once. It's just artificially triggering my own sensory cells. So it really hurts. I mean, I'll cry in front of you if I get stung. But it sort of diffuses the way. It depends on the strength of the venom. But this is lesson number one, class, is that scorpions don't bite, they sting. Come on, class, what's lesson number one? Scorpions don't bite, they sting. Brilliant. Excellent. That's, that's lesson number one. And again, roughly, the rule of thumb is the smaller the claw, the more strong the venom. Not always, but that's sort of a rough rule of thumb. Now, this is the next really cool thing about scorpions you have to know. This is a scorpion I filmed under room light, and then when I turn off the light and turn on a black light, an ultraviolet light, you see this. And I'll show this to you. Their entire body fluoresces this amazing blue-green color under black light. No one's really sure why this is. There are some hypotheses, and we've got some ideas ourselves, and I can talk about that later if you'd like. But that's how we find them. Scorpions are nocturnal. They come out at night. So we walk around with these black lights. 
And it's one of the coolest things you'll ever do. It is so amazing. So that's lesson number two. If scorpions fluoresce under UV light, what was lesson number one? Scorpions of the light, they sting. Right, lesson number two. Scorpions fluoresce under UV light. Brilliant. Okay, you're doing great. Now we love to go out to these sand dunes all throughout the desert southwest. I just go out to Thunderbird with some students and classes, especially in, when it's warm in the fall, and we can easily find 60 animals in an hour. There's a lot of scorpions out there right in the campground out by Lake Thunderbird. But I love these really open dunes. And if you get out of your car and you look close, you'll see these little slit-shaped burrows. Those are scorpion burrows. They're underground during the day. So they actually go down, they make a little spiral staircase, and it's nice and cool and moist down there. And they come out at night to hunt. And if we're real quiet, one might come out, shh. Here it comes. So, so here's the, the sun's gone down, and the scorpion's coming out of its burrow. And it's doing its thing. It walks around, and it'll stop and walk around, and so forth. And this sort of summarizes what our interest is. How do they find their food? How do they find their mates? And how do they find their way back to their burrow before the sun comes up? I treat these guys as little robots. I want to sort of decode the brain, understand how they're wired up to do these things. And we've made some ground on this. We've, with the help of students, just like you, I've, I've managed to uh, make some ground on the whole array of sensory systems. I mean, they're, they're sensitive to light, they're sensitive to heat, they're sensitive to touch, they're sensitive to chemicals. But there's just a couple of things I want to share today. On each of the eight legs, and by the way, eight legs, what do you think they're related to? Spiders. Spiders, right. Which phylum are we talking about? Arthropods, excellent. Do you know that sort of group in the arthropods that includes the spiders and scorpions, what that's called? Arachnids. Arachnids, yeah. Very good. <laughs> uh, so they're arachnids. And on the other side of the phylum, what do you have? So on one side of the phylum, you've got the arachnids, the spiders and the scorpions and such, and ticks and things like that. On the other side of the arthropods, what do you have? Insects, yeah. Insects rule all. There's more insects than anything else put together. But you also have some delicious things over there. Yeah, and lobsters, crawdads, uh, uh, crabs. What are they called? Crustaceans. We're done. Good job. <laughs> But on the eight legs of a scorpion, on their ankle joints, they've got these little grooves called slits and scilla. These are vibration detectors. They're really, really sensitive. I have no doubt that th these animals can feel me walking around here. In fact, I know they can. They're so sensitive. They can feel a cricket walking in sand a meter away. And you know, the physicist said, well, he doesn't really conduct seismic waves, but that's how sensitive these animals are. So what we think they're doing is they come out of their burrow, and they'll, they'll walk and they'll stop, and they'll walk and they'll stop, and they'll sort of settle down in some place and spread out their eight legs until some poor little cricket or something comes hopping along. So if we're real quiet, we might get a chance. Here it comes. <laughs> And so this poor cricket is hopping along. And it's the vibrations that the animal is feeling across its eight legs. And it can, in complete darkness, judge the angle and the distance to the cricket. And it turns, and it moves, and it grabs the cricket with its claws. And then it carefully stings the cricket with its tail. And then it eats the cricket. And here's one I caught right here. You see that it's, it's eating its cricket. The cricket is as big as the scorpion. The scorpion fluoresces, the cricket doesn't, and it's what it's doing is it's spitting out digestive enzymes into the cricket and sucking back the juice. So it'll look like it's sort of smoking the cricket for the next uh, hour or two as the cricket gets smaller and smaller. So that's the way they feed, and that's how they find their, their prey. And if you see a scorpion out by Lake Thunderbird, just take a little twig, and you can kind of mess with the scorpion by sort of tickling the ground and fake it into thinking it's a bug. If you do it a little harder, it'll say that's no bug and it'll run. But uh, they're really, really sensitive to vibrations. Now, the other thing you've got to know are these things on the bottom of the scorpion called pectins. And that's lesson number three. All scorpions have pectins. What's lesson number one? 
Right, lesson number two. Lesson number three. Right, and lesson number four is that pectins are really cool. What was lesson number one? And two? Three. And four. Pectins are really cool. Yes, they are. They are really cool. Um, in fact, most people only carry one comb. I carry two, all right? That's because this is the way pectins are. They're like combs that hang down from the bellies of all scorpions. What do you think they do? Any guesses? They're dragging along the ground. What do you think? That's a great idea that maybe they do have touch sensors in them, but not necessarily vibration. But that's part of the story. So they feel sort of texture. Yeah. They leave like the trails. They don't have to get back to their own. That's a great hypothesis. Uh, he's saying maybe they're leaving some sort of chemical using this. They're not leaving a chemical using it, but they appear to be detecting a chemical. So what does that lead you to? To find mates. And so what modality, what sort of uh, organ would this be if it's detecting a chemical? A sensory, a nose, or a tongue? Yeah, okay. It's like a tongue. It's, it's sort of a big old tongue on your belly. It might be the most elaborate tongue on the planet. Let me show you. Um, they hang down from all scorpions, these brushes. So hopefully you'll be able to see one when I bring it around to you. And I want to show you a video. It's probably the best video I've ever made. Um, except the ones that have Marielle in it. But uh, uh, they, this, this particular video I did when I was a grad student. This was a long time ago. But it's probably the best one I've still I've ever made of a scorpion behavior. Let me set it up for you. Um, right here is a male scorpion. And in a second, I'll turn the lights off. This is a male scorpion in a small arena. There's a camera over the top. I've got a black light on. That's why the scorpion fluoresces. And soon he's going to wake up and start walking around the arena. Right over here, in this part, I sprinkled some sand, which has um, a pheromone on it. What's a pheromone? Yeah, it's a chemical. It's sort of like a hormone, but between animals. It's a chemical that will induce a behavior in another animal. So we think that the females are laying down a chemical, a pheromone, that's causing the males to change their behavior. And you'll see it in a second. So I just took a chemical wash from a female and put it on sand and sprinkled it over there. If we could get the lights. I've set this to music because it's kind of romantic, right? A little, uh, little I think it's Al Green. <laughs> So he just woke up, and he's going to walk over where I sprinkled this sand. And watch the pectins. He backs up, and he starts brushing the ground with those organs. You see that? And there's a really strange thing that happens right here. We don't even know what this is about. But he starts to wag his tail. And I don't know what's going on there. Maybe he's laying out some, you know, emitting some chemical himself. But he's really jazzed up right now. He's definitely picked up on her scent, on her pheromone. And he's doing these little jerky behaviors. And those jerky behaviors are called juddering. It's a real thing. It's in the literature. And we think this is a pre-courtship behavior. We think it's a signal from the male to the female, because I didn't tell you that members of this species are cannibals, and the females eat a lot of males, so this is a really dicey thing, right? So we think this is a vibration signal from him back to her saying, hey, I got your signal, and I'd like to make not be dinner tonight, that sort of thing. So this is a, this is a scorpion pre-courtship behavior, and if you're lucky, you can actually see this out there in the desert. It usually happens in late summer when the males are looking for the females. Now I'm going to just let this go just for a second because there's a point where he turns and it really looks like he's grabbing for the female. It's a little frustrating to be honest, I think, because he definitely thinks there's a female here, at least in my mind. And right here he's going to back up and watch this. 
Well, even right, right there, he reaches, he makes these grabs for the female. That's cold, right? Okay, can we turn the lights back on? Right here. So, I'll turn that down. Uh, we described this in a little paper, and uh, anyway, when you remove those organs, he doesn't do those behaviors. So we think this organ is transducing, is picking up on the female signal. So that's, those are the pectins, but there's, there's more, so just to sort of summarize what we think might be going on, is that the females in the desert sand scorpions that, from West Texas, they maintain their own burrow. So let's let this be a female. She's come out, and she's putting some sort of a pheromone around her burrow. And then usually like August, September, uh, you, the males will start wandering the sand. They each make their own individual burrows. But then the males give up theirs, and they start walking across the sand. And if we're real quiet, maybe one will come along. Oh, here it comes. So he's walking across the sand, tasting the ground with his pectins. And then when he comes over where she was, he starts doing that little jerky behavior, that juddering, like that. And if she's receptive, she will turn and allow him to approach her. And he grabs her claws, the claws are called pedipalps, and he starts leading her in the dance. It's called the promenade a deux. It's, it looks very romantic, it's actually not very romantic. He's now dragging her along, okay? <laughs> and um, this is, uh, they got their parent permission slips in, right? Yeah, this is on camera. Okay, good, all right. So let me just tell you how mating it goes in scorpions. So if you are lucky enough to see one of these promenades in late summer, and you can see these if you get out of your car with a black light. Just put a little twig or a rock behind the male. The male's the one that's leading here. And then he'll stop, and he'll survey the twig or the rock with his pectins, and he'll extrude a sperm capsule called a spermatophore. And it's got a sticky end on one side, and it sticks to the twig or the rock. And it's got a little trigger on the other end. And then he carefully maneuvers her over it, and that trigger hits her genital opening and shoots the sperm inside of her. It wasn't that great, was it? <laughs> That's it. And, uh, and, and then he takes off. He's done. He, she still might eat him, so he leaves. And then, uh, yeah. and, and then the sperm fertilize the eggs internally, and the eggs hatch out inside the mom. And they give live birth. And so it's a 12-month pregnancy, a gestation period of 12 months for these these animals. So let's let this couple get on with their lives. Thank you. And 12 minutes later, you know, see the babies come out. And that, so then they crawl up on the mother's back. Isn't that cute? The little scorpions on the back of the mom. So that's the kind of the whole life cycle of scorpions. But I told you, these things are really cool. They absolutely are. Let me take you on a little tour. It's a spine and a series of teeth. I'll just look at three of them under a scanning electron microscope. Let me flip this over. And you see on the tips of each of the teeth are little dots. You couldn't see this with your naked eye. Those little dots are called peg sensilla. Let's get really small. They turn into a forest of bristles. And let's look right down at the top. All those bristles, all those peg sensilla are all lined up the same way. This is the way the ground would move as the animal brushes its pectins across the sand. Here's one. There's the hole. You have to have an opening. If it's going to be a chemoreceptor, there's just got to be a way for the chemicals to get in. There it is. And these all have little pores. It's a really, really cool uh, organ. There's about 10 nerve cells in every single one of those. There's like 100,000 neurons tasting the ground as the animal walks. I think it's like the most elaborate tongue on the planet. And I will die, you know, I'll go to my grave trying to figure this thing out. It's really, really ornate. So we do things in the lab, right over at Richards Hall. Maybe you want to come see it. We put little electrodes into those. We very carefully immobilize the scorpion while they're alive. We actually try to let them go when we're done. They're very hardy animals. But we put them on their backs, and we elevate the pectins, and we maneuver little electrodes through these sensilla. And then you can listen in to the nervous system. Let me give you a sample of that. So, and we blow chemicals across, and that's what I'm going to do here. Over the loudspeaker, and it sounds like this. Each of those pops is an action potential, a neural impulse. We're listening in to the scorpion nervous system. 
I'm going to blow a one second pulse of hexanol in just a second here. Here it comes. There it is. And that's the response. So that shows me that this sensillum has a neuron that clearly responds to hexanol. And so we've done this with a lot of things. We've tested alcohols and ketones and esters and, and all different chain lengths. It's a really complex work. So that's where we are. We're trying to understand that. And our neurons work exactly the same way. They really do. I could stick an electrode into you right here in the hair and blow on it and hear pretty much the same thing. So what was lesson one? Right. What was lesson two? Come on. Right. Lesson three. All scorpions have pectins. Right. Lesson four. Pectins are tools. And five. Our neurons work the same way. Yes, they do. So hopefully some of the things we learn about scorpions also apply even to your cells. But let's see some animals, right? You want to see a few animals for me? I think I've got four for you. Um, I'm going to start with sort of most impressive, if I could. And to do this, I have to put my glasses on because I will get stung otherwise. Um, I'm going to, I've got black lights here somewhere. Oh, they're back in the back room. Let's see. Hold on one second. And we're going to try to make it very dark in here in just a second. Not yet, Mario. Uh, so these are black lights. You just need to, this little guy here is uh, about 30 bucks online. This is really all you need if you want to be a scorpion hunter. Um, it's a little cold right now, but if you wait till spring, you'll find a whole bunch of animals just walking around Thunderbird out there. So I've got various types of these. So let me see which one do I want to use. Maybe okay. Um, so this animal that <laughs> it's just it's pinching me right now. This one I get from Arizona. I, I get this. I got this one out by Phoenix, Arizona. If you just go to Phoenix in late summer and walk towards your nearest mountain, you'll see these guys. This is the biggest scorpion in our country. Can we turn the lights off? Just imagine you're out there with me, okay? You're out there walking around in the sand, and you, you look around and you see, you see that. See? And, and this one's got me pretty good here. <laughs> Let me try to release it. Oh, there we go. Now you can really see it. This is Hadrus arizonensis, the giant hairy scorpion, which I love the common name, right? That, is that, yeah, get your cameras out. You definitely have to show mom and dad what you're doing here. <laughs> as you're about to get stung. Um, these, these guys are just spectacular. You see their whole body fluoresces this beautiful green color. And no one really knows why. Again, there's just some ideas. We actually think they might be light sensitive. This is very unnatural to have a light this strong, right? Um, but they fluoresce under a black light. You get that? Cool, huh? They've got eight eyes. You might actually see some eyes on the top. They actually have lenses, and very little is known about their vision. So. And they don't, you see, they don't um, auto-fluoresce. If I take the light away, it goes away. So they fluoresce in response to the UV. So there, there's no auto-fluorescence. Oh, shoot, I think I just dropped it. No, 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 I got it. Right here. That's, that's, a, that's a bad trick. That's not good. Don't ever do that. Um, it's hard to see the pectins. Uh, she's got them tucked up, but yeah, you really can't see them very well. But any quick questions? Oh, I'm going right between you. Sorry about that. Is that awesome? So, Hadris Arizonensis from uh, Arizona. Any quick questions before I pull out a couple of other animals here? Oh, Adam has a question. Yeah, fire. Uh, so, you said they fluoresce in the UV light. Does that mean you bet the light of their eyes in the UV spectrum? Oh, boy, that's a great question. It, <clears throat> it turns out their eyes are maximally sensitive to green which is in about the 505 nanometer range. Um, they have a secondary sensitivity to 2395, which is in the UV range, but it's much, much lower. And there's some debate about that. Some think that's an artifact, that they actually are most sensitive to green, 
<coughs> and it was the sort of contamination by the cuticle that gave a false reading there. I don't know if that makes sense. So it's an enigma, right? They, they are sensitive to green. They fluoresce green under UV. They're secondarily sensitive to UV. We've actually got behavioral tests that shows that they're sensitive to both green and UV equally, but not to red and not to orange and yellow and things like that. So I don't know. I think there's something to this. Can we get the lights on? And you'll see it's just a sort of a yellowish colored animal. See there? Um, and I'm holding her stinger between my fingers. If I let go, she will sting the heck out of me right now, and I will be crying. Uh, um, it's in old world scorpions, new world scorpions. All scorpions fluoresce, so it's really well preserved. So it's a really, and who asked the question? Yeah, it's a really great question. All right, let me just show you a few more because you've got a lot of other things coming your way today. But it's like the hardest thing to do is to let it go because she grabs it. Okay. Now I'll pass this around. <laughs> And I don't think she can get out, uh, but uh, she's really jazzed up right now. So she will sting in a heartbeat, and it hurts like crazy. Uh, I'll pass a black light, so if you want to get close up, you can pass it from neighbor to neighbor. All right, um, here's our Oklahoma scorpion. Anyone been stung in Oklahoma? Okay, what did it feel like? Burns, really bad. Burns yeah. yeah. Yeah, how about the same sort of thing? Well, this is what you get stung by, but not this particular one. but. This is the only scorpion we have reported in Oklahoma. It's called Centroides vitatus. You can hardly see it here. It's this little brown guy. <clears throat> and they hurt like crazy. <clears throat> you see they got small claws, so their venom is pretty strong. This is uh, Centroides vitatus, the striped bark scorpion. It's got a little red stripe down its back. It also fluoresces. Not quite as brightly, but bright enough for you to find it. Can we get the lights off real fast here, and we'll see if this guy, yeah, fluoresces nicely. So you can easily see these guys a long ways away when you walk around out there. They come out at night, and they're, they're everywhere. So Centroides vitatus, or Oklahoma <coughs> scorpion. Uh, lights back on. And very good job. I'll pass this around if you want to get a nice picture of it. It's a male. The males have the longer, thinner tails. By and large, in scorpion world, the males have the bigger pectins. Uh, the, the pectin makes sense, right? The, fem the males are searching for the females. The females have pectins, too. And in our local scorpion, there really isn't a dimorphism. It's more the tail length and shape. So if you want to see that, you can pass that around. And then I've got uh, this little guy is what we actually do most of our work on. This is from West Texas. Uh, yeah, question. That's a great question. I want to know the answer. I, I think it, we, well, we think that they're actually, it's a matrix. You saw all those bristles, right, on that thing? Um, we think they're actually learning the chemotextural features all around their burrow and their home. And they're using sort of that memorized that memory of those patterns to get back. So we think they're using it for navigation, both males and females. Yeah. So you said the females the Yeah, not at all. Not our, our Oklahoma ones aren't so much cannibalistic, but the desert ones are. Do they ever eat their children? Yes, they do. Yeah, what's up with that? A lot of the desert scorpions will eat their babies. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you, you guys studied natural selection and evolution. That doesn't seem to make logical sense to eat your own genes. Can you think of any possible ideas here, how that could work? Yeah? I feel like if you eat the smaller, because one of the problems will survive. Oh, that's interesting. That's sort of an in-the-family-selective thing going on. That's, that's a great hypothesis, yeah. There's even some other ideas. This has never been tested, by the way. It's so, um, yeah? Okay, that's one of the leading ideas, exactly. Uh, so, sort of some match with the environments, you might say. Now, they don't really take care of their babies, though. Uh, there is a little water exchange, but they don't really guard their babies. Yeah? So, you say the females eat the males, but when their babies eat the babies, 
Yeah, no, no, no one really knows. That's a great question. No one really knows. I'm just assuming they're just sort of indiscriminate about it. Yeah. Well, what if I told you these scorpions are long-lived? They'll live many years. And they can mate multiple times. Any ideas? Pretty good, huh? Yeah. That's, that's really kind of tying those two ideas together. That maybe if things are lean, there aren't enough crickets this year, might as well bring the resources back into me. I'm, t I'm speaking teleologically. I don't mean to be that way. But that, you know what I'm talking about. So bring the resources back in. Make it through, and that it's been selected for to make it through another year. And then maybe when resources are better and my babies can survive too. Because my genes are represented in those babies. That's great. No one's really tested this, though. If you need a, a master's or a doctorate uh, idea, there you go. Uh, here is, this one's not that impressive, other than we do almost all of our work on this one. This is a female, I think. Um, this is from West Texas. Anyone know where uh, Monahans, Texas is? You know, it's way out west. They've got these beautiful sand dunes. And I find, yeah, it's a female, small pectin on there. This is uh, Pararoctinus utahensis. And we can find hundreds and hundreds of these. Mariel has gone out. We've, we found 200 one night. Okay, let's see the lights. Let's see how, yeah, it fluoresces beautifully. And it's one of the best things you will ever do is to get a black light and walk across the sand dune looking for scorpions. Just watch out, the snakes don't fluoresce. <laughs> That's okay, like, oh, I love that hat back there, that fluoresce. Thank you. All right, so this is uh, Pararachnus utahensis, also a lovely fluorescing scorpion for you. I'll pass the black light. And then the last one is a relative of a scorpion, but not a scorpion. But one of the coolest animals you'll see. It's in here, I, won't, I don't want to disturb it. This, it's, maybe you can kind of see it. Yeah, I saw the reaction. She saw it. It's, this is what they do. They hang out on trees. They're really flat. It, yeah, what do you think it is? It's a relative. It's an arachnid. It's got eight legs, but it actually only walks on six legs. There are two that are really long whips. And they are now modified chemoreceptors. They taste with these long legs. They sneak up on bugs on trees. And it's like the bug's worst nightmare. Anyone know what this is? Uh, whip, it's a whip scorpion. They call them whip scorpions, something like that. Amblypigeon is the common name. They don't fluoresce. If you shine your light on it, it won't do anything. But they're just an awesome arachnid, and I'll let you take a look at that. Really flattened animal. Any last questions? Because I got to get out of here because you've got some amazing animals. Yeah. They are scorpions on my tongue. Thank you very much. Yeah. We found this in Belgium one one at a market and we had to buy it. Obviously, it doesn't fluoresce, which is unfortunate. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, there you go. Up close uh, with scorpions. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it.